Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ruth Wishart. I'm very happy to be chairing this event for the Edinburgh International Book Festival. And this is, um, as you're about to find out, a somewhat unique political occasion, because while a number of his uh, erstwhile ministerial colleagues are touring the countryside, uh, advancing their credentials to be Labour leader, <laughs> our guest this evening is touring the countryside, telling MD who will listen that he absolutely, definitely, seriously, folks, doesn't want the job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. This has uh, annoyed a lot of people in the upper echelons of his party who failed to be seduced by the bearded charms of the member for Islington North. <laughs> of course, uh, this man has a bit of form annoying people. He annoyed a considerable number with his first volume of memoir, and all of, all, almost all of them were journalists and authors irritated that he wrote better than they did. This boy was a sometimes harrowing but never self-pitying account of his childhood scarred by poverty and the neglect of his father, but a, a work too characterised by the selfless courage of his mother and the incredible maturity of his sister who kept the show on the road when they were effectively orphaned. So please, Mr Postman, brings us to the next chapter, um, <coughs> brings us to this chapter in this extraordinary life, and it's a time when... Um, the teenage husband becomes a father of three in his early 20s and the family moved to the outer suburbs of Slough. It marks, too, the time when he became involved um, in the trade union movement uh, under the avuncular eye of Tom Jackson. But for many readers, the fascination with this volume, and it stops in, it, in his 30s, so stand by for the next tranche, <laughs> is the stylish uh, evocation of life in the 60s, 70s and 80s, uh, a lifestyle where he admits... I'm conscious this creates a fair impression of Andy Cap, of a bloke with a self-centred social life that left his wife to look after the kids, cook, wash, and make a comfortable home. Since then, of course, he's gone on to serve in some of the highest offices in the land, in Labour governments, and latterly, he's turned his hand to more implausible pursuits like sharing a sofa with Michael Portilla. <laughs> His choice of sweater on that show has strangely not made him a fashion icon. <laughs> Do I get to talk in a minute? No. <laughs> no, you're the straight man. <laughs> As I've indicated, ladies and gentlemen, he said, resisted all attempts to lure him into standing for the Labour leadership, despite one commentator having described him as Shadow Secretary of State for working class authenticity and having lived a bit. He has, however, joined a number of former cabinet colleagues in suggesting that Jeremy Corbyn may fail the practical as the new messiah and has instead urged party members to vote for Yvette Cooker. Please welcome Alan Johnson. Thank you. I thought it was been quite nice, didn't you? <laughs> you were very good. I'm going to take you around the country with me. <laughs> Let's uh, start a, uh, with a bit about uh, the union landscape today because, I mean, a lot of this book, of course, is how you climbed the, the, the ladder onto the executive of your union. And unions really mattered then, and they had a huge amount of influence. Compare and contrast. Well, I think they matter now. Uh, in fact, they probably matter now as much as they ever did in the past. Um, it diminished numbers, so 6 million uh, compared to 13 million in our glam rock era in the 70s uh, of the trade union movement. Um, I think they struggled, as I struggled as a trade union leader, it was easier for me because I had a captive group of members in Royal Mail and British Telecom. But for the general unions in particular, trying to organize mm. in sort of back shop, back street fish processing factories, you know, the big centers of employment, the shipyards, the coal mines, uh, the fishing industry in Hull have largely disappeared, so it's much more difficult to recruit. I think they've struggled with that, and I think, really, there's a different workforce out there that they've not managed to relate to, perhaps, in a way that they did previously, but they're still crucial. And one of the reasons why we've got such huge inequalities in income now, mm. you know, with a chief executive earning 200 times what their what their staff earn is because of the trade union movement's influence diminishing. Is that a failure of comprehension of, in the workforce to understand why unions matter for them and for their well-being, or is it um, just a number of, of moves by successive governments to disenfranchise the unions? 
Well, I don't know about disenfranchised. I was reminding people the other week that during our 13 years of this so-called virus uh, that we have to be saved from, we introduced the right to union recognition, the right to be accompanied to grievance and discipline procedures, uh, the right for uh, people to have uh, domestic leave, the right for union members not to be sacked for going on strike. So right back from Keir Hardy's time, an employer could sack the whole of the workforce on day one of the strike. We ended that. Uh, the Information and Consultation Directive, all of these things, I think, helped the union movement uh, to recruit, but it's not been easy for them. They find it very difficult to recruit and keep members in so many disparate workplaces. But there's also the problem, isn't there? I mean, the, the, the latest raft of, of um, government initiatives with union membership, you know, the, the percentage that you have to have before you go and strike through a ballot, the yeah. fact that your union levy is, now has to be paid directly and individually and rather than taken off salaries, all that presumably is a factor. It will be a factor if that bill goes through and I'm going to be opposing it with my colleagues. You know, someone was saying in the trade union movement that actually thinks it's over, it was actually the leader of my union, an uh, old friend of mine, Dave Ward, said he thinks it's overrated about trying to win power. But I said, you know, if you want to sum up being in opposition in four words, that they are the trade union bill. So this bill not only says that to have a legal strike now, you need to have 50% of the workforce voting. That's not going to be the rule in the referendum, by the way, for the European Union. Uh, if it's uh, an assent was classed as an essential public service, you need to have 40% of those voting. Um, that means 40% of 50% is 80%. You eventually got an, you've virtually got an 80% threshold to have a legal strike. On top of all that, there's you know six nurses on a picket line. If one nurse joins them, it's a criminal act. I mean, these are repressive measures. Uh, th it's a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. We've got s the lowest level of industrial action ever in our history. But it's, it's a sign, I think, of the vicious kind of anti-trade unionism. Uh, uh, it's a conservative government coming back to unfinished business from 1997. Yeah, well, we know all about 40% rules in Scotland, but we won't go there. <laughs> We probably will go there, Ruth, at some <laughs> stage. <laughs> One of the uh, things we were chatting earlier about is the fact that, um, you know, all, all of this book is about your life, um, not just uh, uh, climbing up the union ladder, as it were, but, but also your work as a postman and what that entailed and, and the kind of life it, 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 it led to for you. Um, and we were talking earlier on about the fact that the number of people who go into... Uh, politics now as candidates very rarely have your kind of life and work experience. How dispiriting is that for you? It is, although at the last election there was a Conservative elected in Cornwall who says he's a postman. I'm checking whether that means he did a week at, as a Christmas casual, but uh, <laughs> uh, apparently he, he was a postman. Um, it is dispiriting, but it's something that I hope the political parties that select candidates will take into account. Because at the end of the day, that's where the problem arises from, as well as perhaps, you know, this treadmill of coming in as an unpaid intern, which you can only afford to do in Parliament if you've got somewhere to live, and that generally means you've got uh, parents with a few bob. Then you become a special advisor, then a seat is found for you, and then you're on that, that ladder. And I think there's concern right across the House about that, that the... But how do you stop it? That the House should be more... Well, you could introduce paid interns, which is a scheme that the Speaker well, started. Yet, cast the net a bit wider in terms of Cast the net a bit wider, yeah. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with having youngsters in as MPs. I mean, Pitt, uh, the younger, was 21 when he was... Uh, 24 when he was Prime Minister. That's when you drop dead at 35. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, it seems... And it's... There's no problem with that being one route into Parliament. The fear was it was becoming the only the route, route into Parliament. The route into Parliament. And the, 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 the trade union movement, the, what we were just talking about, the decline of the trade union movement in numbers has been part of that because people like me, people like Ernest Bevin, not that I'd compare myself to him, Nye Bevan, all of those came, uh, Jim Callaghan, yep. came through that trade union route. Um, before, there's lots of contemporary politics I want to get onto, but before we do, um, life as a postman had its vicissitudes. 
Um, I think we'd like to hear a little bit about one of your, your postal rounds. Yeah, OK. This is... Um, when I was uh, transferred, I joined the post office in London and then transferred to Slough, where we got a council house. And uh, the delivery that was the one that I had my eye on was called Littleworth Common. This had the Home Secretary's residence on it, Dorney Wood. Um, the press have variously said when I was a minister that I'd once delivered to 10 Downing Street, I delivered to Chequers. I must have had the biggest bloody round <laughs> in Europe. I didn't do any of that. I delivered to Dorney Wood. Um, but I didn't want to go to that round. I loved the idea of doing that round because it was a proper rural postman, one of the few uh, genuinely rural deliveries. Just by way of uh, just explaining, uh, the, this Littleworth Common Delivery had three men in it. It was a rotation of three duties. Reg Woolley had... Uh, so uh, Bill Higginbottom was deaf. Reg Woolley, Reg Woolley had a huge conk. And Derek Quincy was always coughing. So we called them ear, nose and throat. <laughs> and, and the only reason I got into that delivery was because ear, Bill Higginbottom, retired, which allowed me to come into the vacancy. So this just describes what it was like delivering in that area. As will have become apparent, the population of Littleworth Common was diverse. There was an Air Vice Marshal at Pumpkin Hill Cottage and a community of farm labourers in Chalkpit Lane. Miss House, the head teacher, lived on the premises at the tiny village school, Dropmore Infants, and received her wages via registered letter every Friday morning, along with a magazine from the National Union of Teachers. And there was the house where a massive Irish wolfhound patrolled the front garden. So far was this beast's head from the ground that he practically looked me in the eye <laughs> as I swallowed hard and unlatched the gate. Nose and throat, as Reg and Derek, assured me that this was the gentlest of dogs, that all he wanted to do was escort me from the gate to the front door, a distance of about 20 yards, which can seem like a mile when you're in a state of barely controlled terror. This wasn't just an escort, it was an armed escort. <laughs> the grey and white woolly-haired hound would seek out an elbow with its teeth and gently clasp it in its giant jaws. Off we'd go from gate to door, as if I were an elderly gentleman being guided to my cinema seat by a kindly usherette. <laughs> Thankfully, I was allowed to make the return journey alone. Once back in the van, I'd use a mail sack to wipe away the copious quantity of wolfhound spittle that had lodged on the elbow of my jacket. Well-meaning colleagues would often tell me that dogs sense fear and react aggressively. I never considered that information to be at all helpful. <laughs> Being scared of a dog is bad enough. Thinking that the very fact that you are scared will encourage the dog to rip your throat out does nothing to quell the fear. <laughs> I want to touch, Alan, on one or two of the, the seminal things that happened politically elsewhere while you were involved with the, with the trade union movement. And, um, it seemed to me quite a parallel journey between the BT privatisation, which happened at uh, that period in your life, and the more recent Royal Mail privatisation, not least in the fact that uh, union members who were advised not to buy shares went on and did so. But do you see these as similar ventures? Well, they were different in the sense that we learned our lessons. Uh, the BT privatisation, as you say, 98% uh, of our members ignored the union and bought shares in the company. And that actually would have been fine if they'd have stayed as shareholders, but you know, who can blame them? Telephonists on quite low wages, engineers, they sold the shares off very quickly uh, and they went to institutions. Royal Mail, it was different. The union wasn't against a shareholding. Indeed, they argued for a chunk. They had 10% and now there's another 1%, but they only keep those shares, or, or they can't sell them for three years. I mean, what I would like and what the union would like is for that to be developed into a trust. I mean, I'd like to see Royal Mail wholly owned by its workforce. That would be something really exciting. In a trust like the John Lewis Trust, where you can't sell the shares outside, you can only sell them back in. So there's a genuine stake. But, you know, next year, I think the three years is up. Uh, very soon, they'll no longer be 
uh, they'll, they'll, no longer be share, they'll no longer be shareholders. But, of course, we beat the government in 1994, uh, when I happened to be General Secretary. We fought a different campaign against Major and Hesseltine, where we encouraged the huge support for Royal Mail amongst the public to be the lead in the campaign. The union facilitated things, but we let others do, his for, do it for us. The Women's Institute volunteered to be part of our campaign. And you don't mess with the Women's you Institute. You don't mess as, uh, yeah, Tony Blair found out, yeah. Didn't you, you though? <laughs> but uh, the other difference was, though, I mean, that, that these restrictions didn't seem to apply to institutional investors with the Royal Mail because uh, apparently a, a tranche oh, of these shares went on pretty well. Scandal. It's a scandal. It's a scandal. It's a scandal, and uh, you know, not just the price they were sold at, the people they were sold to. So Vince Cable, you might remember him, ex-politician and government minister, uh, he said that he wanted these shares to go to you know, the right kind of shares, not to the hedge funds, and etc. But uh, he did nothing to Like George Osborne's best man. Exactly. The right kind of shareholder, or a <laughs> shareholder who's on the right. Uh, who's, yeah. who's got a huge chunk in it, yeah. Yeah. The other thing that you... you seminal policy of, of a Conservative government which com you wrote about very vividly and one of the great things about this book is that it's not written about statistics or anything all of these um, all of these incidents are told in as anecdotes and, and the one that came over very forcibly was the right to buy because that came home very forcibly to you in the, in the little estate you were living in in Slough. Yes well the context for anyone who read the first book my mother lived the whole of her young life waiting for a council house that never arrived. Her dream was to have her own front door. When I married Judy, when I was 18, back in Notting Hill, they were pulling down the road we were living in with her grandmother. Uh, sorry, they weren't pulling down her grandmother. We were living <laughs> in the house with her grandmother. And the council, this was for the A40 extension into London. The council said, you've only been on the waiting list for a year. Uh, it's one choice, take it or leave it, otherwise go and find your own accommodation. Whereas if you've been on the housing list for a time, you've got three or four different yep. options. So we were offered this council house in, in Slough. And if I can just put it into context, so me and Judy went to look at this council house, 30 miles to Slough, which was like the countryside for us. And we got off the train at Slough Station, and there were two Thames Valley coppers leaning up against their pale blue and white Ford Anglia police car, and I went over and said, um, excuse me, do you know the way to the Britwell Estate? And this copper said, I should do. I have to go there often enough. <laughs> and then uh, the other one asked Judy why we were going there. So she said we'd been offered a house there. And he said, I wouldn't live on a Britwell for all the tea in China. This was a lovely estate. You know, this was a two-bedroom house, indoor bathroom, front garden, back garden. And we were very happy there. I lived there for 19 years. When the right to buy came up, Judy, my first wife, was also an orphan. She was raised by her grandparents. To us, this, this and, and it's difficult to say this without sounding pious, but because our neighbours were in the same position as us, it was a real offer that was very difficult to refuse. You got a huge discount. Suddenly, this house became yours. But we felt, you know, that this should be handed on to someone else who'd come out of the slums or whatever. That if we were in a position where we earned some more money, we could move, as many people did, they moved off of council estates and bought houses privately. So we, we refused to buy it. But what I try and describe in the book is it was more than an academic political argument for us, for, for us and our neighbours. This was absolute practical politics about what do you, a, a politics affecting people's lives. So the right to buy, we, we refuse that. Now I think most people looking back either, either see it as a big mistake because of the crisis there is in social housing or that the big mistake was that it was fair enough to do it but to prevent by law the council using that money to build new houses yeah. was the real problem. Uh, so. So I think, you know, now in its latest incarnation, just like trade the Mark, unions, the Mark II social housing. Was, yeah, well, yeah. These, are, these are charities. The Peabody Trust, which exists in London, which my grandmother lived in, which I described in this boy. You know, those places, telling charities they have to sell them off is going to create a huge problem, um, once again, for a piece of ideology. And also, uh, when they're sold off, of course, that still leaves a bigger gap site in the amount of social housing available. Because they won't, yes, and the charities then will not have 
the, the kind of financial oomph to borrow to build more social housing. Yeah. Now, before we um, go into just to what's happening in today's political world, just a couple of Scottish things. Um, you're, uh, sorry, I'm not going to give you a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> but you do mention very fondly Jimmy Reid in the book. Jimmy Reid was my hero, yeah. Jimmy Reid, uh, Rodney Marsh and Paul McCartney. Rodney Marsh was a footballer, by the way. Not a bad midfield line. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In fact, when I met Jimmy Reid once, I was just saying to you, Ruth, outside uh, at a Labour Party conference, I was tongue-tied, as I was when I was ushered into the presence of the great Paul McCartney. Jimmy Reid had enormous influence on me. I mean, it was the, I was 20, 21. I'd kind of read Das Kapital, unlike Harold Wilson, who couldn't get past, past the first page. I worked with a lot of communists in the CWU, and these were guys, mainly men, a couple of women, but, you know, a hammer and sickle tattooed on their chest. It was a religion for them. And I saw how Hungary and then Czechoslovakia, the Prague mm. Spring and all of that kind of affected them. Uh, but, you know, they were, they were decent guys. They were union reps who were selfless. Anyway, I was... I wouldn't go down that route. I was very much a... Uh, I was a democratic socialist and the Labour Party had kind of started to really interest me. But then I came, Jimmy Reid led that Upper Clyde dispute. Uh, but then he became a personality on the television. So, and his charisma, as you know, because I know you knew him personally, was amazing. And he'd left school at 14. He had a huge knowledge of Shakespeare and poetry and reading all the things that I was interested in. He loved football, which I was passionate about. And he made these wonderful uh, speeches. The speech on alienation when he was uh, elected as rector of Glasgow University was an amazing speech. For me to read all that, you know, but as I say in the book, just about the time that, that I was thinking, where do I go politically? Yeah. Jimmy Reid left the Communist Party of Great Britain and joined the Labour Party. So I thought, I'll do the same. So me and Jimmy joined together. <laughs> But 300 so you, miles apart. You didn't yeah. follow on and join the SNP when he did, obviously. No, 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 no. I didn't, I didn't take that route. It's an interesting contrast, the way you describe Jimmy and the terms you've just done now and the way you describe people like Arthur Scargill, because there was a lovely quote in the book which says, uh, the union rep's job is not to predict rain but build the bloody ark. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously you thought Arthur Scargill was more of a rainmaker. Yeah, I was... Um, I don't know. You know, there's two types of trade union leaders... Uh, there's the people like Tom Jackson and I think Jimmy Reid who are looking for practical solutions to problems. I mean, Jimmy had a lot of charisma, you know, but he was, um, um, in my terms, he would have never have led his members into a dispute that they couldn't win. Or if he had, like Tom Jackson did. In 1971, I was a 20-year-old postman with three kids out on strike for, for seven weeks, all out strike, no strike pay. So it turned out your and benefits were more than your basic wage? <laughs> well, I'll tell that story in a minute, yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so when I went to this, so we're out on strike. My youngest son, Jamie, had just been born. So I had seven weeks paternity leave, courtesy of the Union of Post Office Workers, as it was. But, we, but in those days, you could get some benefits for your dependents if you were on strike. And all these men and women from the Union of Post Office Workers were queuing up to be assessed and I eventually got to the front of the queue and this woman there, this clerk, said, no, Sonny, it's only for your dependents. <laughs> I, I was very fresh-faced. Um, <laughs> in fact, just a, one anecdote to another, um, my first Christmas on the Britwell Estate, my wife bought me the Incredible String Bands LP, 5,000 Layers on the Onion, some of you might remember, and a razor. <laughs> and I went upstairs, I said, oh, I'll go and have a shave. And I went and had a shave, came down, running, rubbing my chin in a manly kind of way. So that was a good shave. And Judy shouted from the kitchen, did you put the blade in? <laughs> and I said, uh, no, no, there was already a blade in there. She said, no, that was a cardboard dummy. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I got to the front of the queue and this lady said, I'm sorry, Sonny, it's for you. And so I had to get out all the birth certificates. So she believed that I was married with three kids. Anyway, what this, we just went to decimal coinage in the middle of that strike, and this was just before, so this was old money, just about. 
and I was earning 12 pounds, 10 shillings and sixpence for a 48 hour with the post office. She gave me 12 pounds, 11 shillings and threepence. And so perhaps my reputation as a militant, no, stay out, stay out, don't go back. <laughs> We did lose out on overtime and allowances and all of that, so it was tough. But Tom Jackson, when he realised that we weren't going to win, and it was a big defeat for us, uh, he led us back to work and cobbled together some commission of inquiry, which meant we got 1% more than we were originally offered. So it was seen as a crushing defeat, but Tom Lift took that on the chin impact. and yeah. led us on. And, you know, you have to be careful of what people's motivation is, what... You know, you have to always beware of the egotists as well. Well, uh, let's, let's fast forward a bit to more recent political events. I mean, you, obviously you were in the Labour government, you'd held all manner of high office, but then comes uh, two crushing defeats in uh, 2010 in the coalition and latterly, of course, in May of this year. What's your own analysis of what went wrong? Oh, crikey. Um, in a nutshell, there's lots of different things, obviously. Uh, 2010... We didn't defend our record properly. Uh, you know, this, um, if anyone wonders why Alistair Darling's the only man ever known to go to a Leonard Cohen concert to cheer himself up, <laughs> read, read what it was like. As Lehman Brothers crashed, the whole of the financial services industry crashed, the second biggest bank in the world told Alistair, if you don't, don't do something soon, people are going to be standing at cash points with no money coming out, their savings gone, their mortgage is gone. And when Alistair said, what do you mean soon? What do you mean next week? Or what do you mean uh, a couple of days? Three hours, we sat around that cabinet table and we introduced things like the car scrappage scheme to get manufacturing working again, future jobs fund to keep 18 to 24 year olds in work. Um, you know, we've reduced VAT for a year to get people spending. So by the time the election was on in 2010, the economy wasn't in recession, it was growing again. That, that, wasn't, that, was that almost wasn't the narrative that sold That wasn't the narrative. Gordon was painted as, you know, abroad. He was winning prizes uh, from Nobel Prize winning economists. Here, uh, you know, we probably took the hit for that. 2015, we seemed reluctant to tell the true story of what happened on the economy. Which, you know, no matter where you stand politically, that recession that began in 2008 wasn't because Labour recruited too many teachers or too many nurses, you know. But this great big fat lie, don't give the keys back to the driver who drove the car into the ditch, they maxed out on your credit card. We seemed to have no response to that. And you could see that a week before election day on that Newsnight live broadcast when Ed got hammered by that. And I think his theory, well, I don't, you know, I'm not knocking Ed, although I, I've always been critical on this, his theory seemed to be fight the 2015 election, not the 2010 election over again, which kind of is, makes good sense in most areas. But on the economy, given that that was a huge part of that election, I think we, we were hit on that. Was uh, he a credible prime minister? Yeah, I think he would have been a, a decent prime minister. Yeah, credible. A man who... Uh, who had beliefs, had very strong beliefs, who knew what he wanted to do, um, uh, never managed to really get off the, f off the back Excellent. foot in terms of his leadership. Um, uh, but, you know, the economy plus lots of other things, but I think the economy was the main problem for Which us. Which brings us neatly, of course, to the current leadership election. Um, you broke cover uh, the other day in The Guardian, saying basically that... Um, whatever else Jeremy Corbyn was, he wasn't a Labour Party leader, and um, urging the troops to vote for Yvette Cooper. So talk us through, what, first of all, why you think that, and secondly, why you felt obliged to come out and say so. Um, well, uh, I think leadership is very important. It's very different from anything else. The reason why I frankly would never run for the leader of the party is I didn't think I had those special abilities that you need, not least of all, a passion to do it and an ambition to be the leader. I had the ambition and the passion, as you read in the book, to be the leader of the CWU. It was a different world coming into Parliament. So I think if you're going to do the job successfully, you need to have the ambition to do that. Jeremy's a perfectly decent chap, nothing wrong with Jeremy at all. 
But if you've got someone who's rebelled 500 times against the party, who's been disloyal from, to every leader from Neil Kinnock through John Smith, etc., they're not going to make the best leader to unite the party and tell their troops, you've got to follow this disciplined line. And it's very much something from the trade union movement. The trade union movement brought into the Labour Party uh, you know, more Methodism than Marxism, but certainly that, that you know, the Labour Party was created to take power. And leadership from Keir Hardy onwards has been an important part of that. I don't think Jeremy Corbyn's a leader. So why is Yvette Cooper a leader? I think Yvette Cooper is... A, I think we've got an opportunity here. I happen to think she's the best candidate. She also happens to be a woman. When we were created, Keir Hardy's, you know, was minimum wage, Scottish Parliament control of working hours, all things that came in after 1997, certainly. But also, we were the first political party to campaign for votes for women. Then in the 70s, we introduced equal opportunities legislation for women. And then in the 90s, all women shortlists transformed the House of Commons. It didn't balance it up yet, but it certainly brought in 100 women in 97. And yet, we've fallen behind. We've got every prospect of having, electing two men as leader and deputy but leader. That, bring, that, that begs the question as to whether or not you're supporting Yvette Cooper as a form of positive discrimination or whether you think she's a no, better I, candidate than yeah. Andy Burnham. No, I did say, Ruth, I happen to think she's the best candidate, but she's also a woman. And if not now to elect a woman leader, I think, I think Yvette's got that bit of steel in her character uh, that will, will, uh, w which will make her a leader. She's also got experience. She's got a good political track record. What she's saying, I agree with, in terms of the party. And they're not all. I mean, they're, it's very different. That's to who you'd Liz like Kendall, to win. Who do you think is going to win? I think Jeremy looks like he's going to win. And then? I'm o I'm only looking at what the pollsters tell us, and that can always be a big mistake. Uh, the track but I bump record in, recently is not good. Yeah, but in my constituency, you know, um, I don't think this is a kind of takeover from outside. Lots of young people are going for Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and in that, there's something, you know, I think leadership's important and I think winning the next election is important. But actually for these young people, and, and for some of them coming in, leadership, you know, in, in a sense there's a distrust of leaders, um, of traditional leaders. And as far as winning the next election, that's not seen as important. And I had a woman in my constituency who's been a friend of mine for 20 years, was a primary school head teacher, now retired, the most sensible person you could find. I bumped into her in Sainsbury's, in Hessel. She said, I'm voting for Jeremy Corbyn. And I said, but we've got to win the 2020 election. She said, well, I don't think we'll win it anyway, whoever we elect. So you kind of, so given all those different strains, uh, and un undoubtedly some people coming in who want to, the Labour Party look more like the Greens, I think uh, it, it will be Jeremy. One last question before we let the audience in. Um, you obviously watched the Scottish referendum from a distance, but then you watched as the Labour Party in Scotland lost all but one of its seats. Looking at it from down there, how did, what did you think? What did everybody think? Well, it's seen, I came up here as well for a, a few times, but I mean, I, I knew Scotland very well as a trade union rep. I was up here a lot. Uh, it was a major part of my support in the union. But it seemed to be something that nothing could stop. The stemming on from the referendum, I mean, people here would know this much better than, better than me, there was a tide, and the tide seemed completely unstoppable. I don't think we expected to go this far. I think I'm almost in the only Labour seat we hold now with Ian Murray. And I came up to Ian Murray's dinner last November at Tyne Castle, no, Ian was involved in hearts. There'll be a lot of Hibs votes going then. Yeah, a lot, a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the taxi driver who took us there to the dinner, you know, I, I just I was having a chat. He said, why are you going there? I said, oh, Labour Party uh, dinner. He said, the Labour Party's finished here. And he said he wasn't a nationalist. He'd been a Labour supporter. But he put it down to us appearing on the same platform as the Tories. Um, and, like, there was no rationality to it in the sense of saying, oh, but... If we agreed with the same thing, why not share a platform with someone from another political persuasion? I, I saw how toxic this was north of the border, which is perhaps difficult to understand if you hadn't been through the poll tax and all of that. Um, and so, you know, in a sense, when I came up to Paisley to help Douglas Alexander... That went you, well. I, that went well, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should have stayed away. Uh, 
you know, the force was there and you got the impression when people were stopping people in the streets, they were kind of telling you what, they, what you wanted to hear rather than how they intended to vote. Right, we're going to let the audience come in now if we could have the, the lights up. We've got two mics because this is the posh tent. Um, but <laughs> could you wait until the mic comes before you throw a question at Alan, please? Who's going to start us off? Somebody up there, just to be difficult. Third back row. <coughs> In your book, you uh, wax, um, I was going to say lyrical, but that's wrong. You give a very good account of the uh, deprivation under which you were brought up and uh, the uh, strength of character which overcame that. Do you think that uh, the, um, the people who are today designated as poor are in the same situation as you were in your youth? Yes, um, but hopefully not in those same dreadful housing conditions. I mean, you, you know, you'd have had them in Edinburgh and Glasgow and Liverpool, post-war Notting Hill, although we didn't see Hugh Grant or Julia Roberts down our way very much. It was more <laughs> North Kensington, London West 10. Dickens would have recognised that, that housing. You know, no gas, uh, no electricity, gas. Uh, traditionally sort of two families on every floor, one to a room. All of that largely disappeared by the mid-60s. But the poverty, so there's relative poverty and there's absolute poverty and there's lots of arguments about that. Um, but you can measure both and there's still absolute poverty, let alone relative poverty. And there's certainly still poverty of aspiration and poverty of ambition and all of the other things that uh, great labour politicians used to talk more about in the 30s. So, so yes, I think that is the case. The fact is now, of course, we measure it because we want to tackle it. This government say they want to tackle it as well. I'm very proud. We took 1.1 million children out of absolute poverty, 1.8 million out of relative poverty. And you might remember pensioners were living on 69 pounds a week with income support up till 97. These were mainly women in their 80s who hadn't paid enough national insurance contributions to even get a state pension. Putting a state pension up meant nothing to them. Uh, you know, tackle it. that was real poverty. Pension credit largely was the reason why they got dragged out of poverty quickly. So yes, it still exists. Who's next? Somebody there on the, on the aisle? Thank you. Thank you. Um, you, get, you gave, sorry, this is going back more to uh, contemporary stuff. Um, you gave your reasons for uh, favouring um, your candidate in, in the leadership election, um, which were perfectly reasonable. You see her as being the, uh, the better candidate. Um, but what do you say to those people within the Labour Party who seem to be preparing already for a schism should or when Jeremy Corbyn wins? I mean, as far as I can see it, they're, they're the anti-Democrats within the party. But what they are saying now and what they are preparing for now seems to be uh, laying uh, a track of broken glass and nails, etc., for, for once uh, Jeremy Corbyn is declared as the leader. Well, uh, my advice would be cool heads and steady hands. You know, uh, I, I was a supporter of one member, one vote right the way back. I worked with John Smith when I was uh, leader of the CWU. And what John Smith introduced was unfinished business, tragically unfinished because he died a year later. Uh, but I was very much behind what Ed Miliband was doing. Uh, of course, the gateway to that is the Parliamentary Labour Party. They decide who the candidates should be. And I think there's a responsibility on them, because whoever gets the job has to work with the PLP. You know, you can just about get by uh, not working with other branches of the, uh, of the Labour movement, but the PLP is essential. That's why the PLP had this total... Uh, control over who was elected right up until uh, the early 80s. So I think members of the PLP who gave their candidature, not because they supported Jeremy, but because they wanted a wider debate, I think they ought to be very, think very carefully about their responsibility in the future. But if Jeremy wins, Jeremy's the leader. It wouldn't be unusual, incidentally, for people in the Labour Party to dislike the leader who's just been elected and start planning and plotting against them. It's uh, almost a tradition. I mean, yeah, well, Jeremy's been involved in it enough times, he should know. So, 
so, uh, so that's not that, that's not uh, that, that's not unknown. What do you think, Alan? Though about the, I mean, one member, one vote, of course, uh, wonderfully democratic. But what about the pay three pounds and become a supporter and get a vote? I mean, yeah. Well, I think the only thing I'd say there is the timing of that. Probably, you know, the cut-off date should have been a little bit earlier. But look, we're looking for mass a mass membership party. That's what we aim to be. Uh, we want trade unionists to pay to come and have a say in what we're doing. It wasn't so much trade unionists I was thinking of, but Tory MPs. Yeah, well, that, I mean, they, they got found out very quickly, didn't they? Uh, I, no, I think there's a pretty robust system in place to flush out this. What you can't flush out, of course, are the people who voted for SNP or voted for the Greens and now want to come and uh, join in our election. Nothing you can do about that. That's fine. If they're converted to Labour, great. Lots of them will be converted to Labour if we elect the right leader. Uh, and they might leave again if, in their terms, we elect the wrong leader. But I don't see how you can object to that. You might say the cut-off date ought to have been a bit earlier because, you know, there was bound to be uh, a concerted effort behind one candidate or another if you left it to run this long. But I think the idea of getting as many people involved as possible has to be a good thing. Somebody tweeted today uh, when they knew you were appearing here, wondering whether or not Labour's efforts to find out if these people are genuine supporters or not might um, uh, contravene the Data Protection Act. Uh, I can't answer that question, but it probably it might well do. I don't think, no, I think what we're doing at the moment is finding people who are Tory MPs. Uh, who probably a job in sh shouldn't? Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, true. Well, I know it's pretty hard to find a Labour MP now as well. But. Anyway, uh, we'll, we'll, yes, somebody there, and then somebody on the left. Hey, Mr. Johnson, uh, I, I'm sure you were in trepidation about facing this massive audience this afternoon, but at lunchtime in the world at one, the, there, were, there was a a major article on people who had actually been excluded from the, the, the Labour Party and they'd had emails to say their vote was not going to count. But my real question, which I was thinking about a few minutes ago, was having looked after the public for many years myself and other guys, um, does the working man still exist? The one that existed in the 20s, 30s, 40s, does he still exist? Because in any political, I'm not political, but in any political d debate, the working man is always quoted. Alan, just before, you, yeah. just before you ask that, could I say that there will be positive discrimination if the next question comes from a woman? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know about you. What annoys me is hard-working families. We always hear about hard-working families. You know, I'd like to hear a little bit about the families that don't work so hard, but perhaps <laughs> enjoy their life. And uh, um, uh, do, Does the working class still exist? Yeah, of course it does. Of course, very, this is one of the issues with the trade union movement as well. There was a mass, tra you know, you could, sociologists will take you through this, that post-war there was a big expansion of the middle classes because, you know, if I put it in terms of the post office, um, there were new supervisory inspectorates sort of introduced and, and there was a big move over from blue collar to white collar. So the traditional working class has diminished it's still there, and many of those who moved, or their, their forefathers moved into the, those white collar jobs would classify themselves as working class. I think what we have to be careful here, going back to what you said, Ruth, about who's coming into parliament now, is we mustn't get so inverted in this that we, we say if you've got a university degree, it actually counts against you to get selected, because lots of those kids who've got university degrees are the children and grandchildren of that amazing generation post-war that wanted to see higher education expand, that wanted to see their kids get the chances that they never had. And for the Labour Party now to say, sorry, this, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of almost part of... Uh, uh, it's, it's de rigueur now. Uh, we're, we're going to exclude you. You're part of... Um, Too posh uh, to stand. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the... Uh, of, of, uh, yeah, bourgeois. You're part of the bourgeoisie now because you've got a university degree. Would be, I think, losing faith with that with previous generations. The lady got the mic there, I think. I wanted to go back to poverty for a minute. And um, there've been a lot of sessions at this festival, very excellent sessions, in which uh, levels the 
present levels of inequality in this country have been evidenced and described, and the growing levels of poverty, including working poverty. Um, and I wanted to ask you why you think that's not generally understood and accepted, and why the Labour Party <laughs> did not make more of this, does not make anything of this, and where the rage is, because there's, we're going to be uh, very soon, something like the second country after the US in terms of inequality. And this is the country that was the founder of the welfare state. It's, it's, it's horrific, but yeah. nobody seems to think so. Well, I think, they, I mean, you know, even the IMF now say that inequality is a huge issue. Um, uh, when you get the IMF saying that, you know there must be something wrong. The, the Piketty, Thomas Piketty book about capital was a bestseller last year. I mean, to be fair, you know, I'll take all the criticism as to why we lost the last election, but Ed Miliband touched upon this time and time again. He didn't have the immediate solutions, but he, whether it was, you know, producers versus predators, whether it was his speech that he made in a Dimbleby lecture, I think it was, about this, uh, this fact that, and in fact, he put it this precise way. He said, in the past, economic growth flowed down to the workforce. Now, people feel they're no longer sharing in economic growth. It goes, it gets siphoned off at the top, whether it's in shareholder value or whether it's in higher wages, amazing wages for chief executives, you know, obscene compared to what their staff get. So I think it's recognised, and I think we tried to articulate this, and maybe in our first term we were focused on pensioner poverty and child poverty and the minimum wage, which rose very slowly, but you've got to remember it was new and if it had failed and if suddenly jobs had been lost in textiles or whatever people would have said it was a failure i think osborne saying he's going to raise it to nine quid shows that we actually succeeded in keir hardy's great vision of a minimum wage but it's not a living wage it's a safety net below which you can't go we concentrated too much on that perhaps in our 13 years rather than how wealth was being divided in our society. It's not an easy thing to do. You can put minimums in there, maximums are a different thing, and actually affect, you know, in a free society, if you're not gonna be a command and control economy, um, God forbid, then it's very difficult to find the mechanisms to turn that around. But I think the problem is identified, and it does have to be tackled. Thank you, gentlemen there. It feels to me as if progressive social democratic parties across Europe are in a bit of a mess just now. It's not just the Labour Party here. I just wonder, you know, if you looked into your crystal ball, what, what do you think are the, the best kind of strategic directions for, you know, for social democratic parties and movements to be, to be going in now? Well, I think... I mean, to me, the Labour Party has been about two things, greater equality and the eradication of poverty. All else are means towards those ends, in a sense. And I think social democrats everywhere want to see that fairer society, a more equal society. Um, not in a sense of a rigid system that insists that everyone gets a certain amount or whatever. Um, so I don't think we should move away from those principles. What's happened is the financial services crash, as, instead of being blamed on the bankers, has largely been f as a result of some process of, of um, uh, alchemy. Suddenly it was the fault of a uh, society where they were sharing out too much, where workers were getting too much money or whatever. I mean, it's crazy. So this issue about how you tackle the deficit is a big issue here. Uh, it was a big issue, of course, in Greece and in Spain and in other countries, and by and large, the left, uh, mainly because lots of them were in power at the time the crash happened. You go to Greece, PASOK almost doesn't exist, which is the Labour Party equivalent. So I think they took the hit on that to a huge degree, and I think Social Democrats have to hold their nerve. We, ha final point on it, we have a system in this electoral system which I don't agree with. First past the post, I think, is ludicrous. You don't have it for Scottish parliamentary elections. But what it does, it forces parties to kind of take in people to join parties when they would rather stand on their own two feet. That's part of the problem we're facing in Labour at the moment. Because first past the post, winner takes all. 
And I think our system actually doesn't help the situation in, in this country. And where, you know, what's happening in, in, in Greece is they're splitting away uh, from Syriza and forming a new party. Well, that's perfectly healthy. You wouldn't do it here because you wouldn't stand a chance of any electoral success, apart from in Scotland, perhaps, where, where that, <laughs> that rule has generally been broken, yeah. Now, we've got two people wanting to speak, and, and we haven't got much time, so what we're going to do, if you, if you would be kind enough to give the microphone to this lady in the front, and then there was a lady in the end there, if that... And if we'll just take both of them first, if we may, yes, Alan. Sure. So... Hello. Uh, with left-wing rhetoric coming from the SNP, socialist rhetoric, how does the Labour Party grow again here? Hold that thought. Um, my question is on the House of Lords, because... Um, I thought that Labour maybe had a majority in the House of Lords, and I wondered what your thoughts are on reform. OK. Um, look, I'm, I'm going to be meeting the new fabulous leader of the Scottish Labour Party tomorrow, and uh, I'll take her advice about how to deal with, with things here. The only thing I know is we should be proud of our history. We weren't formed for one specific reason, either to leave the European Union, which was UKIP, or to... Uh, take Scotland into a, a separate uh, state, uh, which was SNP. The SNP have been very clever at how they've changed. Uh, and I, I'm full of admiration for the way they've led that change. Um, but, you know, I think we have to take advice from Scottish Labour people, not impose a solution from Westminster. House of Lords is a ludicrous, ridiculous anomaly in the 21st century that we still have an unelected second chamber. Uh, ludicrous. And every time you talk about uh, resolving it, you get all these arguments from people who were good comrades of mine in the Commons who agreed that it was a terrible thing. And then they go there and think it's the greatest thing because don't forget you have all this wisdom that you can draw. You can, you can have that wisdom in an elected second chamber. So, you know, uh, dear old Keir, because it's his 100th anniversary of his death um, uh, next month, a hundred and uh, years later, we're still arguing about this. The Lords have a wonderful way of protecting themselves. But it, to me, I'm, I, I, I can, I'm ashamed that this country still has that kind of uh, anomalous system. So we're safe from a Lord Johnson? Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> I say here, on film. <laughs> yes, you're safe from that. One last quick uh, corollary to this lady's question. Um, there is a debate, as you probably know, in Scotland, and you'll be meeting Kezia Dugley tomorrow. There's a debate in Scotland about whether the Labour Party would flourish more in Scotland if it were fully autonomous rather than being, uh, as was famously described, a branch office of London? That, uh, t to me, Labour is about, you know, solidarity. Uh, but I would take... I, I, I would be very cautious about that, but I think we have to take the view of Scottish Labour very seriously. You're chickening out. I'm chickening out. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, we are out of town now. This book is called uh, Please Mr Postman. It's a terrific read, as you might imagine, have it, if you've read the first one. It's a terrific read, but all of Alan's books, and the next one, in fact, is also going to be the title of a Beatles song. So each of these uh, memoirs is a Beatles song. And we were discussing what the third one might be called, and I've cautioned against yesterday. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's going to uh, go to the signing tent now, which is left and left again. As you know, he'll be there to chat to you to sign copies of the book. It's a terrific read. Please buy it, and please join me in thanking Alan Johnson. Thank you.